so my name is Mike Parham. I'm here today to talk to you about a new feature in Rails 2.3, which is Rails engines. Um, I am a uh, local Austin Ruby developer. Uh, I've been doing Ruby professionally for about two years now. And uh, I discovered Rails a few years ago, probably like some of you, after doing Java for a number of years. Um, and like I said, two years ago, just decided that I had to do the Ruby thing. And so uh, I'm currently working at a company called OneSpot here in town. Uh, before that, I worked at a company called Five Runs. Uh, I'm the author of the Data Fabric Gem, which is, uh, adds database sharding to Active Record. And I'm also the maintainer of the Memcache Client Gem, which ships in Rails and is used to talk to the Memcache server. So um, let's, uh, let's step back in time a little bit and uh, travel back a couple of years. Who here remembers the year 2004? I assume most of us were here. Um, Ruby developers have a reputation for being very young. So, um, so 2004, Lord of the Rings was um, tearing up the Oscars, and uh, the Indonesian tsunami uh, struck. So those are two two big uh, events, 2004. But the the big event for us was, of course, Rails. Uh, DHH and the 37 Signals crew released Rails about five years ago. And um, at the time when you built a Rails app, that was it. It was just a Rails app. It was you know, a, a directory with some Ruby code in it. And um, this is fine. This Ruby code it initializes the Rails gems, the Rails subsystem, and just conforms to some NBC conventions. It was light years ahead of, of most other systems people were using at the time. Um, but people, you know, people wrote their first app, and they got really excited about it. Then they wrote their second app and their third app and their fourth app, and they started realizing there's a problem here, okay? Two, flash forward two years later, 2006. Who remembers 2006? Well, I don't know about you, but you know, you're smoking your cigars in your country club because your stock portfolio is going through the roof. Your, your home's worth an all-time high. Uh, unfortunately, lolcats had a death grip on websites at the time. So this is my... Uh, this is my homage to lolcat presentations. Um, but in 2006, Rails introduced the concept of plugins. And that was the problem was when you built all these applications, you had, to, you had to copy code between all of them. So now with plugins, we have a way of sharing Ruby code and Ruby functionality easily, of encapsulating functionality. So Rails introduced this, this plugin script which uh, added concepts uh, of plugin sources. It allowed you to discover new plugins, to list available plugins, and install plugins. What does this sound like? Ruby gems. They essentially reinvented Ruby gems for, for, for uh, the first pass at plugins. So now Rails plugins are gems. They're, they're special gems, though. They have a, a Rails init file which Rails will run to bootstrap the code in that plugin. Um, you, you simply add the gem to your config gem, your, con your list of gems in your configuration, and, uh, and Rails will add that, the lib directory for that plugin to its auto load path so that code can be auto loaded. And that's all fine, that's all fine and well, except people started noticing further issues. Some, some functionality that couldn't be encapsulated. That is, plugins can do Ruby stuff. They're very good at, at adding classes, uh, changing existing classes, adding redefining methods, monkey patching in general. But they can't do anything with the MVC stack. They can't add views. They can't add controllers. They can't add routes, that sort of thing. So flash forward. Or, and, and the reason why they can't do all this is because Rails has all this infrastructure that's completely separate from Ruby's load path, which is they have concept of controller paths, they have the concept of view paths, they have a concept of, of routing configuration, that plugins have no idea what this is. So who here remembers 2009? <laughs> um, we elected a president, we held a really cool Ruby conference in Austin, Texas, and we released Rails 2.3. And that's what that's what that's all a Rails engine is. Is it's a plugin which has the necessary hooks to do MVC type to encapsulate MVC type functionality. 
into something that is distributable, i.e. a gem. Really, really what, it, what, what it becomes is, is an engine is a Rails application. It's a Rails application that's running within your Rails application. You can, you can, that's, that's one way of thinking about it. So to get down to the nitty gritty, um, engines just like a normal Rails application have an app directory. And this app directory has the standard directories that you would expect any normal Rails application. That is views, controllers, models, and helpers. And Rails will auto add those paths to the various subsystems, to the various uh, paths that it knows about internally so that it can find your code. Note that when you have two directories which are competing to, uh, which Rails is trying to find code in, it will always put the applications path last, or <coughs> code in, in the applications directories will always be found, will always be used in preference to the engine's code. So um, going deeper down into, into models specifically, Rails will find any models that the engine provides in the app models directory. There is a limitation though that migrations don't work with engines. You can't have a DB migrate directory and have the database auto built for that. Another thing to be aware of is just something to be aware of in general with Ruby code and plugins and that is beware of name collisions. I don't think it would probably be a good idea for your engine to, to create a user class, for instance. It's quite a popular name for a class. So instead you use modules to namespace your, any classes that you need. That's uh, very standard. Um, all the engines I've seen in the wild these days are using uh, namespaces to, or modules to namespace their code. So I don't know if it, people can read this. You know, it doesn't look like it's very readable. But this is effectively how Rails, this is the code Rails actually uses to set up the V and the C part. Um, basically it says if there's any engines, then we add the routing configuration, we add the controllers, and we add the views. And, and in each one it just, it's collecting the routing files, collecting the controller paths, and it's collecting the view paths. The, the, the only thing of interest there is at the bottom, which is it not only adds the view paths to action view, but also adds it to action mailer. Engines can also send email. So if you're using action mailer to send email, you can stick your view templates in the app views just like normal. And they'll be, the, uh, the engine can provide those views and they'll be found. So controllers, um, Rails will look in your engine's app controllers directory. It will install routes from config routes, as you'd expect. Um, one, one small cap, one small, I'm not sure if it's a bug or, or by design, but one small limitation I found is that if you use helpers all to load all helpers into all of your controllers, um, Rails will not load any engine helpers. So you'll need to load that helper by hand in, in whichever controller of yours needs it. View templates will be found as normal, as you might expect. Um, one limitation of the view layer is that Rail, a Rails application has a concept of a public directory where its static assets go. Your engine, because it's running as a gem somewhere else, um, because Nginx and Apache look at that public directory and they don't know about your engine, any, any uh, static assets you need that you would like to put in a public directory, you can't, you can't uh, just put it in a public directory in your engine. You would need to copy those files to the application itself so that, um, so that they can be served by the web server. Um, some miscellaneous notes, engines and plugins actually um, also can add rake tasks to the application just by adding .rake files to lib tasks. Um, like I said about migrations and static assets, if you, you can copy those files to the application's directories and that'll, that'll work fine. Um, there's two ways I can think of to do that is, is by putting code in Rails init to do the file copy. That is when the engine is initialized, when the application starts up, it would do the copy. But again, because that's run every single time, that would get redundant, start to get redundant. Or you can create a rake task which does it, but that of course has the limitation that the user would need to invoke the rake task to ensure that it's done. Um, plugins used to have this install.rb hook, which would run when the plugin was installed. Unfortunately, because we've moved to gems, we don't have that hook anymore. 
So you can't use um, that install.rb hook to, to copy those files. Here's, here's some code that I wrote to, uh, to solve the problem in my own engine. Um, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. It's just doing a file copy from the, from the engine's directory to the, uh, to the Rails application, to the corresponding Rails applications directory. So one limitation in this is it's because we're copying files by hand <coughs> is change management. Um, if, if the Rails applications in Git are subversion, obviously now that you're copying files to it, the user would need to add those files to their, their source repository and then they would need to manage it. If they upgrade your engine or downgrade a version, they would correspondingly need to upgrade or downgrade those files that were copied over. Um, ThoughtBot has a, um, an engine called Clearance, which I'll talk about in a second, but they go to great lengths to deal with this problem. It's, um, it can be some hairy code, but uh, unfortunately it's a limitation of, of engines. So like I said, there's uh, one notable engine that I'm aware of, which is ThoughtBot's Clearance, which is uh, user authentication for Rails applications. One, one big limitation in Rails, in, in my opinion, is the fact that we've never, never really settled on a way of doing user authentication by convention. Everybody seems to reinvent the wheel here. And uh, you know, you've got plugins like RESTful authentication and whatnot, but, but that's effectively copying a lot of code into your application. So we've never really settled on a, on a way of doing this. Clearance is, is an attempt to you know, push it forward one more level so that it, you have even less and less code in your own Rails application. But it is a full-blown engine in that it provides controllers and views to do things like sign in, sign up, um, forgot password. It'll email the user when they sign up. So it does a lot of the, uh, the conventional stuff that you'd expect user authentication to do. For this talk, I wrote my own engine called Queso. And Queso is a dynamic search engine for a database model. You mark a, a database model as searchable, and Queso will provide a user interface to find, to construct a query for that model and find, rel, uh, find rows that match that, that query. So here's what Queso looks like in TextMate. It looks like any other normal Rails application. That is, you've got controllers, helpers, models, and views. Here's how it integrates into your application. I simply, I have a, a user model, which I'm, I want to search on. I mark the user as queso searchable, and I give it some options to configure some of the, some, uh, some of the features of queso. In the controller, I just include the helper, because the helper provides some methods that are used in the view itself. In the view, we just render the filter area, and we render the results area for that particular model. <laughs> this is what it looks like. You can see up top, we've got a form to build a filter or a query, whatever you want to call it. You add constraints, you can add sort expressions, and you get a search button. And then down below, uh, you see the results of the query. Obviously, this is not production ready. It's not something I would consider, you know, it's more of a toy for, for this talk, but. There's a, there's, a gem of there's a kernel of functionality here that could be useful as uh, if people, if myself and other people want to spend some time fleshing it out. But, um, but this, as you can see, this is a plugin and, and the, only, the only code in my application is really these four lines of code. So we're providing full MVC stack functionality in, reus in a reusable uh, set of code. So um, that's, that's really just a quick, a quick uh, sort of meander through engine as itself. As, as I've explained by trying to explain the history of it, um, it's really, engines is really just the, the next step in making plugins more and more functional. First you had the monolithic app which had no ability to share code. Then you had this concept of plugins where you could share Ruby code. Now you've got a concept of engines which not only allow you to share Ruby code, <coughs> but share full stack MVC functionality. And that's all. Any questions? Yeah? 
you have any trouble testing any of these changes? That's a good question. Um, obviously, you need to have a framework in which to run your code, right? So in, in, in my testing, I, I wrote an example app, which was the user, that user model and other stuff. And I, and I tested that by hand for the most part. Um, I don't pretend to be an expert in engine testing. Um, ThoughtBot has that, that clearance engine. They are very good at testing. And I would, I would guess that they've probably got a lot of infrastructure that you could look at in clearance to, uh, to see some best practices for yourself. I don't, I don't necessarily know how to change a controller. Um, obviously, uh, you, can move, you can monkey patch stuff. Um, but I'm not, I'm not positive if you, can, if you can do something like that. I'm not even, um, yeah, I mean, well, that's what I meant by monkey patching. Yeah, I mean, you can reopen the class and redefine an action. But, but again, you're, 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 you're copying code and you know, making a fix or something like that. Um, in terms of view templates, the, um, the application's view templates will always win. So if you provide a file at that exact path where the engine's view template would be found, Rails will prefer the application's template. So you would, if you have a template you, wanna, you don't like or you need to style differently, you can just copy it from the engine into your own application. So engines are not a new idea necessarily. They have been around for a couple of years now. Um, there, there was a, a, I don't know if what you'd call it, a meta plugin or something that added an engine feature to Rails you know, in, in the 1.x timeframe. Um, you could certainly use something like that if you needed to, uh, to add engine type functionality, but I'm not so sure that it would be, I'm not so sure that it would be compatible in terms of having a source base that could act as a, an engine in 2.3 and an engine in 2.2 and 2.1. You know what I mean? So um, I'm not so sure that's something I would tackle. It's, it may be something you, you, you might want to examine, but it's, I, I'm not, I don't know how that, how that would work. Any other questions? Yeah. Is it, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand your question. So your, your question is, can you, can you run an engine as an app by itself? Right. It, is, it is effectively a, um, a, a Rails application. It, what it's probably not going to have would be things like the script directory to have the scripts to start server and console and stuff like that. Because technically it is a plugin. Um, it does have, you know, I, I like to think of it as 95% of a Rails application. But there, there's still some infrastructure that an engine would not have. Um, but, but like I said, it, you know, with regard to the testing question too, you need to have some sort of framework in which the engine runs so that you can test it. So I don't, I don't see any reason why an engine couldn't ship an application, which is just a really lightweight layer to expose its own functionality that you can use for testing, for demos, that sort of thing. Um, but but I, I, don't, I don't know how to do that. Um, by making it a gym, and you'd have to you'd have to you know go into the gym and type script server there, right? So yeah, I don't know. I, I guess that's the problem waiting to be solved. Right. Anything else? Yeah.
interested? Anything else? That's good. I, I was actually just thought of that last night. I was like, I wonder if an engine can depend on a plugin in vendor plugins. Um, I don't think it's possible. But it's an interesting, uh, it's uh, Russian nesting dolls or turtles all the way down, right? I mean, I, I don't think that kind of recursion would work, but it might, might be interesting if it did. Ask him. Yehud is in the back. He asked uh, if, if Rails 3 is going to support engines or how it's going to change. Okay. I'm sorry? Cool. All right. Well, I guess that's all. Thank you.